So Hello everyone. Hello good, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. We are very excited to have you join us for today's event. My name is Erwin, and I'm part of the team who's been running this program over the last few months. Today, we have hundreds of people from all over the world, investors, partners, social impact actors. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking the time, whether it's late evening or early morning for you. Last year, when we announced that Google was launching a new accelerator focusing on the sustainable development goals, we had no idea about what was going to happen in 2020. When the pandemic started to become evident, we had to make a decision on what to do next. And for us, it was never a question of whether we would keep doing it or not. The crisis that we're experiencing highlights more than ever the challenges that our world is facing. Climate change, healthcare, education, economic opportunity are at the forefront of today's headlines. And for the last six months, we worked hard with 11 amazing startups that are tackling these challenges heads on. And today we're very excited to have these entrepreneurs tell you more about their work, their impact, and what the future holds for them. So today we have a very full agenda. We will start with opening remarks from Jason Titus, VP of Engineering. Then the startups will each present their products and have a few minutes to answer questions from the audience, from you. So you can write your questions in the chat window. Then we will have a short five minutes break. And after that, Agni, director of Google for Startups, will make some remarks before we continue with a reminder of startup presentations. But before we move on with the agenda, I'd like to thank all the people who made this journey possible. First, all my amazing colleagues that have worked really hard behind the scenes to make this accelerator possible in a very challenging environment. Shiri, Hanako, Moore, Lillian, Jen, and Jeremy, joining meetings at 6 a.m. from California with kids running around has been the day-to-day -day life of our program. And without the commitment and expertise of each and every one, we would not be here today. But this accelerator would not have been possible without the help of many more Google employees who volunteered and offered their time to support the startups on a weekly basis, from program managing to technical experts, funding advisors, or partnership mentors. They all showed up during challenging times. And there are hundreds more volunteers from within and outside Google who happily provided feedback, guidance, opened up their networks, and made intros to various companies and NGOs in order to accelerate the startup's growth. Thanks to all of you. And of course, our leadership, Jason, Thorsten, Yossi, and Agni for sponsoring this program. So thank you again, everyone. And with that, I will now hand it over to Jason. Jason, please take it away. All right. So it is uh, it is really wonderful to get to congratulate everybody for finishing this uh, the accelerator. This is something that the team and myself have been uh, really excited to get going. And obviously, in a time when we have uh, a world that is changing in so many different ways, uh, you know, whether it's through climate change or growing cities, uh, the challenges of, of providing food when uh, you have such dramatic weather changes and concentration of population. All of these areas seem to be immense challenges for us as, as a global society. And the idea for Google to actually be able to help people use technology to go in and uh, really tackle the problems that they see uh, excites us. And hopefully you've, uh, you've seen that through the mentorship and engagement that our teams have had. Uh, so I want to I want to congratulate everyone for having finished this program, uh, and and the you know when we see the the kinds of solutions people are putting together, it's been exciting. Certainly for myself, uh, I live in in the Bay Area in San Francisco Bay Area in California, and three weeks ago we had more than a thousand lightning strikes over one night, which doesn't normally happen. Uh, we California does not normally get uh, has not historically gotten. Uh, big thunderstorms. But in one night, we had more than a thousand lightning strikes. And the next day, or even that night, everyone was trying to figure out what, what is happening, you know, is what is going on? Are there things we need to be worried about? I woke up myself immediately. We were out in the, in the mountains and I had no way of knowing. And uh, by the next morning, we were 
trying to monitor fire radio or look on social media, is anyone saying anything? Turns out that there were almost 20 fires burning across the Bay Area. And the next a day later, my family and I were evacuated out of our homes. Uh, and, you know, many people ended up losing, losing their homes and uh, being, you know, their, their, the lit places that they knew, the animals they had, all of this uh, was impacted. And at, certainly as, as a, a technologist, I could see the, all of the areas where there were things not happening. People couldn't communicate. Their amount of data they, about what was going on was, wasn't there. We saw, you know, fire departments race to go start, stop a fire in one place only to discover that it actually was on a, another ridge far away. So it made me wish that the solutions that companies like Aurora are working on were already in place. So the opportunity, you know, just that that's that's what I've seen in my own life in the in the last month. I think across the world right now there are so many challenges. There are so many areas where people are suffering, people are having to manage with complex situations that that didn't exist, whether it's uh the work that uh Flair is doing uh or, or OCO, uh, there, there are, you know, you have situations where uh, a small amount of applying uh, machine learning and understanding of the problem actually can, can enable, whether it's through finance or whether it's through uh, actually just creating infrastructure, uh, you know, where, where in a major cities where people are, where the population is growing so rapidly, having people who understand that problem and can go in and bring tools uh, like, you know, whether it's you take leveraging the, the millions of, of mobile devices that are internet connected in those areas and machine learning and data processing. Uh, all of these things are capabilities that didn't exist coming to solve problems that are, uh, that are facing us. And so that's why all of us at Google have been so excited to figure out how our platforms can be used and how we can uh, engage with training uh, and mentorship and, and connecting folks with networks to actually help the people who are working on those problems like these 11 startups and actually get, uh, get solutions in market and sc start scaling them up to a way where they can have a uh, broad impact. So I wanna congratulate everyone for, for completing this program and knowing that if this is not the end, we are gonna have uh, folks working to help you be successful going forward. Uh, and we will continue to work the community around uh, using our technology to leverage and improve uh, the work of, of folks like yourselves. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll hand it off so we can start to hear what everyone's up to. Thank you, Jason. And thanks again for supporting this program. All right, now is the time we've all been waiting for. It's time to learn about our amazing startups. So each of our 11 startups will present their company, and then you will have an opportunity to ask them questions. So you can post your questions in the chat window, and we'll try to get to it. Each startup will have about three minutes of Q&A, so we apologize in advance if we can't get to your question, but the startups will happily follow up after the events. So across our 11 startups, you will see today that their impact spans most of the 17 sustainable development goals. And we are grouping the presentations across four different thematics. We will start with education and healthcare, then environment, followed by climate, and finally, we'll have economic opportunity. For our first theme, education and healthcare, we have three startups, Wondertree, MDoc, and Flair, focusing on SDGs 3, 4, 5, 9, and 10. So without further ado, let's start with our first uh, startup, Wondertree. Hi, my name is Vakas and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Wondertree. And I'm really excited to be here and tell you more about Wondertree. So at Wondertree, we develop augmented reality-based games for the therapy and education of children with special needs or children with disabilities. Our aim is to make special education and therapy cheaper and accessible for every child in the world. But before I tell you more about Wondertree, allow me to tell you a little about how Wondertree actually started. So it started with Usman and his brother. So Usman is the CTO and co-founder of Wondertree. And Usman has an older brother with special needs. His name is Hamza. One day Usman walked into the room and saw Hamza playing his Xbox. And Usman noticed how motivated and engaged Hamza was while playing his Xbox. And that's when it hit Usman that why can't I use the power of gamification 
to develop Hamza and educate him and uh, bring more out of him. And that's how Wonder Tree started. Now, Wonder Tree is focused on solving a challenge in Pakistan when it comes to children with special needs. And the challenge is that there is limited infrastructure in Pakistan. There are only 550 institutions for more than a million children in Pakistan. And there is a limited resources challenge as well. There is only one psychologist or therapist for 250,000 Pakistanis. So how do you bridge the gap, the infrastructural gap and the resources, human resource gap by technology? And this is what we did. We have developed augmented reality-based games by gamifying cognitive and therapeutic exercises. And then we also have developed reports which tell the progress of the child. So as soon as the child is done playing a game, you can measure the report of the child. And this makes our solution affordable, accessible, and effective. It is affordable because average therapy cost in Pakistan is anywhere from $30 to, to, to $284, averaging around four therapy sessions a month. Whereas with Wonder Tree, you only pay $3.5 a month. Our solution is accessible because all you need to play Wonder Tree games is a laptop or a PC, a webcam, and a stable internet connection. And it is efficient because gamification accelerates development. It is a greater motivational and engagement tool for the child. And the child's progress is being systematically report, recorded. So you know how well the child is improving. We have competitors all around the world. These are our com some of our competitors, with the main one being MindMaze, who, uh, who were valued at over a billion dollars in 2016. So we have already, already received the market validation from them that there is a huge scope and a huge market when it comes to technologies such as these. But how are we different from our competitors? It is mainly because we rely on human pose estimation uh, uh, for our games. Uh, we're using AI for that. And this makes us cut down on the hardware parts uh, that all our competitors use. This makes us cheaper. And this translates into the marketing terms that we can tap into the untapped market of B2C customers, which, which are the parents. And we can significantly lower our prices because of the lack of hardware, which is needed. But most importantly, we're different because of our passionate and amazing and multi-talented team, which is a mixture of psychologists, therapists, game designers, designers, uh, AI experts. Uh, and this, uh, this makes us the most different. So talking about the industry size, we are an, at an overlap of different industries, mainly the physiotherapy industry, the serious games industry, and the disabled assistive technology industry. On average, our industry size comes out to be $17.6 billion. And this industry is growing year on year. The present and the future. Our revenue model is simple. We charge per month per child subscription. Our target audiences include in B2C, schools, hospitals, uh, clinics and therapy centers, and in B2C, it includes ch parents of children with special needs. Right now, we have 6,000 users, and by December 2021, we hope to achieve 18,000 users. Right now, we're in only one country, which is Pakistan, but by the end of next year, we hope to achieve four different countries. We hope to be operating in four different countries. We're already talking to Qatar, UK, Canada, and South Africa. These, have, these markets have shown very promising interest. Uh, right now, by the year end, our revenue is going to be $251,000. And by the next year end, our revenue is going to be $705,000. And here's the big ask. We're looking to raise a million dollars and the amount is going to be used for further development of Wonder Tree games, for R&D, for clinical trials, FDA approvals, for launching our new vertical, early childhood development vertical. This is something really exciting. We already have buyers lined up for our product. We need to develop it. And we want to expand globally through this investment. That would be all. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, that's what happens when we are live. So thank you, Akas. Thank you, Asalang, for joining us for Q&A. And uh, we have uh, some uh, questions. So first question from uh, Robert. 
how do you measure social impacts uh, qualitatively and quantitatively from this platform? Is there a methodology framework that you use to create better programs and effective intervention at scale? Yeah, so uh, the platform is a twofold uh, exercise for us. Uh, one part is the games naturally, the other side is the reporting. The reporting captures all the data quantitatively uh, in terms of uh, you know the reaction time and then the agility balance of the child that the if the aspects which we intend on measuring uh, through like psychometric assessments uh, and then the qualitative part we get through our feedback loop sessions in which we invite teachers facilitators parents um, medical professionals uh, special educators these people come together and they give us feedback on how to improve games how to create like better exercises if, if there are any interventions which require uh, cer certain you know modifications through it which we can achieve through gaming so these are the two um, things that we use uh, and to uh, you know like for effective intervention at scale that uh, that we are working on with different research universities we have partnered up with uh, major universities in Pakistan to uh, evaluate our impact on the children of specific uh, learning and motor uh, difficulties. Great. Uh, another question uh, related to the current situation. How did you cope with uh, COVID given that uh, businesses had to shut down during the pandemic? Yeah, that was a really tricky situation for us uh, initially. Uh, we started working on our B2C platform in which uh, initially we were doing depth sensing through the Xbox Connect. Uh, but then we had to scrap it off and we started doing uh, some, you know, modifications to the AI camera that you have. Uh, so uh, the RGB camera that you have uh, available on every laptop. So now we do that sensing through that and that helped us bring down the capital uh, cost of the product and help us scale uh, to different markets, uh, plus the parents as well. We started doing it directly uh, through our database of institutions and uh, parents. Excellent. And one last question. Uh, as you're looking to expand in other markets and, and looking at the North American market in particular, uh, mm -hmm. what are your expansion strategies? Um, right now, what we've started doing is we've taken up um, a number um, and we're registering ourselves in uh, through Stripe um, so that we have like a presence there. Uh, and we are talking to different distributors who could, uh, you know, help us distribute the product to different B2B organizations. Uh, and we have generated some interesting leads and we hope that uh, by this year end, we'll see some traction um, tapping into the California and the Texas states. These are the two states that we've targeted initially. Uh, and we're hoping to test our product market fit and the pricing strategy with, with which Google has helped us a lot uh, over the past few months. Uh, and we're gonna test out that hypothesis. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rasalan. Thank you again for joining this accelerator and bringing such passion uh, to, to this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Our next uh, startup is MDoc with uh, Neka, who is joining us from uh, Nigeria. Neka, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Erwin. Hello, everyone. My name is Neka Mobison. I'm co-founder and CEO of MDoc, a digital health company which optimizes the end-to-end -end care experience for people living with chronic health needs in sub-Saharan Africa. My father was a hardworking middle-class professor from Nigeria who wanted two things in life. One, to spend more time with his family and two, to transform the technology landscape of Nigeria. But unfortunately, he died prematurely from massive complications from a stroke that he suffered at the age of 53, largely because he did not have access to a team of providers to support him in managing his uncontrolled high blood pressure. More than 28 million people have died prematurely across sub-Saharan Africa from chronic conditions such as hypertension and diabetes in the past 10 years. And that number is expected to more than double in the next 10 years if the status quo remains. In Nigeria, our current market, 36 million adults are walking around with diabetes or hypertension, and urbanization is driving these numbers up. And WHO predicts that 20% of them will die prematurely with no interventions, especially in the context of health systems with severe undersupply of doctors and nurses. At MDOC, we're working hard to change that with our high-tech, high-touch integrated care platform. Meet Mrs. Richards, one of our members, who is a 53-year-old teacher with a five-year history of diabetes. Mrs. Richards, like millions of people, had not been able to get her diabetes under control 
due to multiple delays in the system. The first delay was a lack of knowledge and what healthy changes to make to her lifestyle or where to go for preventive in-person care. The second delay was around finding that affordable clinic that could provide her quality care. There wasn't a tr trusted directory of providers. And the third delay was at the clinic. She'd have to wait for hours before being seen and more often than not would receive poor care. These delays had not only translated to uncontrolled diabetes, but also left her feeling deeply frustrated and unempowered. In January, Mrs. Richards found out about MDOC from a doctor at the hospital, who is a regular participant in our virtual teleeducation program for healthcare providers. Her doctor referred her to MDOC because he felt that she could benefit from the personalized nudges on lifestyle modifications from an MDOC dedicated coach. She signed up on our digital platform, Complete Health, connected with a coach who conducted a risk assessment and co-created health goals with her. The coach invited her to visit one of our in-person nudge hubs to show her how to track her metrics and use the digital platform. During the assessment, her coach said, hey, you haven't had an eye exam in three years. Let me pull up Navi Health, MDOC's geocoded directory of health providers, and help you find a licensed ophthalmologist near you for that exam. Fast forward nine months later, Mrs. Richards has lost 7% of her weight, gotten her diabetes under control, she's taking less meds, and she loves MDOC so much that she's one of our community ambassadors. Well, what makes us different? Well, we have this nice fluidity between in-person self-care supports and digital care. The majority of, of our almost 8,000 members have a household income between $100 to $200 a month, 82% are women, and 79% have a smartphone. What we've learned is that for even those with smartphones, high data costs and low digital literacy necessitates a multimodal experience. So if you don't have a smartphone or don't have data, no problem. You don't ever need to download an app. MDoc still works. We will meet you where you are. We believe that by addressing the needs of patients like Mrs. Richards, there's an opportunity of $3 billion, of which we can capture $100 million with partnerships and our evolving network of community ambassadors driving that growth. How do we make money? On the B side, we partner with corporates and offer an annual per member per month fee for us to enable their people to manage their health. We signed a multi-year contract this year with one of the biggest global companies. And on the C side, we also charge a per member per month fee to individuals. We offer tiered pricing between two to $17 a month with a freemium model as well. Through these efforts, we've been able to achieve significant impact. We've demonstrated greater than nine point reduction in average systolic blood pressure, which decreases risk of premature death by 5%. We've also seen reductions in weight and blood glucose, and we've been able to do this in a financially sustainable way, doubling our user growth in the last five months, which has allowed us to achieve a CAC ratio of 8.1X, which we believe is sustainable over the long term. We're really proud of our focus on evidence generation, which is enabling us to be seen as an industry leader. And we have been presenting on the clinical efficacy of our work in global scientific conferences. In fact, just two weeks ago, we presented our work at the World Obesity Conference. It's this focus on being commercially driven and evidence generating, which allows us to get significant inbound traffic and build our brand so much so that it has recently allowed us to enter into discussions with a major global company, on expanding into two other African countries. In terms of our team, I'm an engineer turned pediatrician and my co-founder has a background in engineering and finance. This is the team that is executing across clinical ops, technology, including AI, as well as data science. We're raising a million dollars with $100,000 in committed capital to provide us 18 months of runway and help us integrate USSD as well as offline capability into the platform as well as rapidly expand our partnerships and community ambassador network. Our vision is that by working hand in hand with potential partners like you, we will be able to contribute towards achieving SDG 3.4 and ensure that more people are living healthier, happier, and longer lives so that they can fulfill those dreams and their purpose, catalyze a positive transformation in areas such as technology that my father was working on, and then share those fulfilled lives with their sons and with their daughters. Thank you. Thank you, Neka. Thank you so much. And thank you for always being a bit in these challenging times. I uh, love your smile. Uh, all right, we have uh, a question from uh, Rosemary. Uh, what is the smartphone penetration in Nigeria and how does it work with people that don't have smartphones? 
Thank you so much for that question. So uh, right now, smartphone penetration in Nigeria is about 42%. It's expected to uh, grow to about, uh, I guess, absolute number wise, 142 million by 2025. The reality though is that about 21% of our population today only has basic or feature phones. That's MDOC's population specifically. And also even those with smartphones, many of our members are actually not comfortable uh, using their phones for, for uh, you know, uh, with, with kind of a, with, from a smartphone perspective. They're much more comfortable um, with SMS, et cetera. So we've actually integrated dual way SMS. We've integrated it with WhatsApp, Telegram. We've integrated it with voice just so we can meet people where they are and ensure that we reach you, whether you're in the rural area, whether you're the urban area, regardless of your comfort level with technology, we will work side by side with you to invest in building that literacy. Thanks. Uh, next question from Dr. Modupe. Uh, digital health didn't seem to have the same uptake in Africa as it did in Europe and North, Af North America from COVID. Uh, how has COVID impacted your business? Thank you so much. So I think the, the reality um, is yes, I, there are a number of barriers to digital health uptake uh, across Africa, but I will say that honestly overnight for, for those of us in the telehealth, telemedicine space, it was really critical because it, it, it really changed the notion that you can't leverage digital, digital health in Africa. People had to be more receptive. So in our case, uh, because of the populations that we serve, we serve vulnerable populations that have chronic disease, those most at risk for the severe complications from COVID, we actually literally had to, to expand the breadth and depth of our services overnight. And, and actually in the last five months, almost six months, we'll have seen almost triple our user growth um, during these times of COVID. So for us, it's actually been you know, quite positive but because we developed this integrated care platform from the get-go, we were serving these same populations and we were really able to meet them where they were in this, in this pandemic. And we think there's a huge opportunity ahead for us. Thank you, Nika. Uh, all right, we have time for, for Q&A, but uh, we encourage uh, our audience to ask more questions and, and Nika can, can follow up offline. Thank you, Nika. Uh, okay, our next uh, speaker is Maria from uh, Flair. Maria, please go ahead. Uh, Maria, can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Hey, you can go ahead. Please go ahead. One sec, sorry. Okay, we are having some uh, technical issues here. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, to the. We can hear you now. Uh, Maria, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Hi. Hey, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Sorry. Can you can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm sorry. We're having some uh, technical issues. Yeah. Here. Sorry. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's uh, <laughs> do the. Hi, I'm Mathieu Carlier. Hi, I'm Maria, one of the founders of Flare. 
Claire is an emergency response platform. And I want to start today with a story about a boy named Dominique. This happened in 2016, just about two months after I had met my co-founder, Caitlin, here in Kenya. And at that time, Dominique was just nine months old. He was being treated for meningitis in one of Nairobi's major hospitals, and he needed to be moved to a different facility for intensive care. Now, as was common in 2016, his father was asked to find the ambulance to move his son. But given that this is a hospital in central Nairobi, there's actually many ambulances in that area. And since the doctors and nurses were assisting Dominique's dad, he was, we had expected he would for sure find an ambulance. Uh, but this was not the case. After a very long three hours filled with dozens of phone calls back and forth with over 20 providers, Dominique passed away. And to provide some very important context, Nairobi is is a met, uh, modern metropolis. It's a, it's a business hub of East Africa. And it's a place where at the time of Dominique's death, you could actually use an app to order a pizza that would arrive at your door in 30 minutes. And at the time of his death, you could use an e-healing app to call a taxi anywhere in the city in minutes. And yet in this most important moment with Dominique's life on the line, nobody could find an ambulance. That year in 2016, for critical emergencies, even things like heart attacks, car accidents, the average response time in Nairobi was three hours. And if you think this sounds strange or crazy, consider that nearly two thirds of the world, 57% of the world's countries have no meaningful 911 systems at all. And the countries that do, they still have issues of fragmented fleets, slow response times. The point is stories like Dominique's happen every single day by the thousands. One obvious part of the problem to us at that time was that traditional 911 systems cost billions of dollars annually, and they're built on very expensive, outdated infrastructure. So being tech and healthcare specialists, Caitlin and I decided to use the cloud to put providers onto a single platform, but to build a platform that is cost-effective so that it's actually affordable and feasible at this global scale. And in 2017, we launched this version zero, the Flare platform that you see here. Um, and the version zero of the Flare Dispatch Center. And three elements of this solution that we wanted the market to validate at that point happened actually very quickly. Number one was that our very first call for help, we used Flare to respond in just 15 minutes. That was a 92% reduction in response times. Number two, the, uh, in order to fund this dispatch center, we created an insurance-like membership product. Members get access to the dispatch center and they're covered for emergencies. And this validated our revenue model because this membership sold very quickly. Within two to six months, large corporates like Uber, Bolt, security companies had purchased the membership for all of their teams, their drivers, their guards, and we quickly had about 25,000 members throughout Nairobi. This meant that daily rescues started to come into the dispatch center. And, and the third thing, uh, and the final thing that we wanted to validate was that within months, emergency responders from all over Kenya uh, started to actually contact us to join the Flare platform. So this, this uh, was a barbecue that we had to celebrate the launch of our dispatch center. And I wanted to show you this video only because it's actually very difficult to describe in words just how quickly we mobilized this network of completely distributed responders. Seeing so many of them in one physical space for the first time, was a really rewarding moment for our team. And it was also a very important moment for, for the various emergency responders because um, people were very genuinely excited to meet each other. Um, candid conversations around being in the field, uh, what it's like to be an emergency responders and really business, important business conversations started to unfold uh, and solidified our relationships. And we realized that we had built an emergency response community that previously did not exist, uh, the first and largest of its kind um, in East Africa. And so today, two and a half years later, uh, we have over 1,000 first response professionals on the platform, hundreds of ambulances that we dispatch throughout Kenya. And in the last year alone, we have rescued over 2,000 people. Our response times continue to drop as well. Today, we have increasingly more and more uh, responses in as fast as just two, three, and four minutes. And here's how we do it. You can call for help using a phone or send us an SMS, or you can also use 
a digital button that members like Bolt have actually built into their own application using our API. So that's all of these requests when they come in are automatically mapped and responders are automatically sorted by distance ETA and first response capacity, things like ambulance equipment, team training level inside the ambulance, um, so that we can actually organize the right response. We use Flare's healthcare database to find the right facility, one that can provide the needed treatment and it's actually ready to accept the patient when they arrive. Um, and to make this affordable to the 57% of the world uh, without 911 systems, this cloud and mobile-based architecture that you see here assembles and operates a national response network in less than 1% of the cost of a traditional 911 system. I, our membership does the same on the other side. We sell to corporates, families, and individuals. So the cost varies based on group size, but we've been able to cover some groups profitably for as little as just three US dollars per person per year. And this is because emergencies do not happen annually. So the unit economics are very healthy. And outside of our investment in tech and product, we became profitable on the dispatch side within one year of launching the membership. In Kenya today, we have 60,000 active members, more than 200,000 users connected through digital SOS buttons. And after three annual renewal cycles, our churn is less than 2%, which has been the focus of Fair Today, investment in tech and systems for scale and expansion throughout all of Kenya. This was supported by three funding rounds, 25 angels and institutional investors from around the world. And today we are raising our Series A. This is a $3 million round that will support growth through marketing sales and expansion to new geographies. And last week we closed 2 million of that. So we have $1 million of the round remaining and we're looking for one or two more investors to join us so that together we can start to focus on the remaining 57% of the world's countries without any 911. This is a $200 billion annual market and our team today is ready to take that on. We are. 25 technology, engineering, healthcare, and business minds from around the world, united by a vision of a world where stories like Dominique's are not a daily reality and where preventable death, distress, and disability are eliminated. Because no matter where you are or who you are, Flair is only minutes away. Thank you, Maria. And uh, hi. Caitlin, uh, thanks for joining us for the Q and A. All right, uh, we have a first question. Uh, isn't this usually a public service? Um, Caitlin, do you want to take that? Oh, sure. So that's a great question. Actually, in every single country where nine one one or nine 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 exists, even in you know um, publicly run healthcare systems, it's always a public and private partnership. And we do just the same. And so while we're delivering a, a public good and service, we do that through smart technology and enable that to happen. Great. Uh, other question for you. Uh, how big is the market? Isn't that a small market? How many people really have an emergency? Um, I think on the average uh, globally, is, or in markets where 911 is well developed and people use it a lot, um, the average is once is 3% to 7% of people annually. So it's a significant market, especially looking at 57% of the world's countries with no 911 at all. And those that have 911 systems um, that are not sufficiently handling the traffic that they need. All right, yes, 3 to 7% is a good chance of uh, calling a service like this. Uh, in terms of uh, scalability, uh, our next question would like to grow to know what are your growth plans uh, after you close this uh, funding round? We So one of the things that I mentioned um, in that recording was that we actually have never done marketing to date. And so the growth that we've achieved in membership sales um, were, was all done organically through incoming and, um, you know, incoming um, sales. And so we are going to market and go to new geographies as well as uh, expand to additional services, things that we've started to do recently, like security. Uh, another more technical question. Uh, what are your current revenue streams? Uh, is there a customer acquisition cost slash uh, lifetime value ratio you're trying to achieve? 
Yeah, Caitlin, can you take that one? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That gets really detailed, but I guess the, the short of it is, is today, uh, among our current customers, we've had only 1% churn. So it's an incredibly sticky product. So the lifetime value is, is actually quite high. As it relates to customer acquisition, we haven't spent any money on acquiring customers outside of, you know, sales meet effectively zero. All right, you were freezing for a moment, but I think you were saying that you didn't spend any money on marketing uh, to acquire your, your customers, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's an easy number to, to defend. Uh, all right, let's see if we have any more questions from uh, the audience. It looks like uh, not. So thank you again, uh, Maria. Thank you, Caitlin, for joining. Uh, and uh, looking forward to working with you more in the future. Our next uh, startup joining us from Germany is APIC. And this is uh, related to the environment theme. So uh, APIC, uh, Katarina, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Katarina from APIC AI. And the challenge we address is the worldwide perishing of insects. After becoming a beekeeper myself, I started to investigate the phenomenon from a scientific standpoint. And what I found was a severe lack of knowledge regarding how to tackle the issue on a global level. There were no tools whatsoever to systematically validate the hypothesis about the underlying issues. Given the technological resources that we have available today, I found this really frustrating and really unacceptable. And so my co-founders Frederik, Matthias and I, we assembled a team to generate the missing data with the help of machine learning. Why is it so important to find a solution? In regional studies, the decrease in insect biomass over the course of just a couple of decades has been very dramatic. And as most of the animals on earth are insects and many, many plants depend on the pollination of these insects, this has a huge effect on the overall loss of biodiversity. If a problem cannot be solved, there may also be serious consequences for food security as one third of our global food production is affected by pollination. As far as research goes, the use of plant protection products has been one of the major drivers causing large reductions of insect populations. To stop this, the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, has set trigger values for the effects substances can have on bees to still be in line with the protection goals for pollinators. Unfortunately, these values cannot be accurately measured with the existing protocols. The data on mortality, for example, is collected by manually counting dead bees carried out of the hives by their colleagues. In the picture, you see um, the wired box beneath the hive, and that's where the dead bees would be counted daily by a biologist. However, if a bee dies like two meters away and or loses orientation in the field after visiting a flower, um, this would not be registered at all. And so this method um, doesn't really reflect the impact of a certain substance on the, on the overall hype. The approach we're taking is a different one and it's digital. We use technology to turn honeybee hives into biosensors. And to do so, we have developed a visual monitoring system for beehives. As you can see, it is attached to the entrance of the hive where it continuously films all bees entering and leaving. We then apply machine learning to analyze the video footage and derive specific insights. This way we can directly and quantitatively assess the impact of plant protection products on the bees. To assess activity, we analyze the overall traffic of the in and out of the bees. Our measure for mortality would be the discrepancy, that is the number of bees who do leave but they do not return. We also detect how many bees return with pollen pellets on their legs. You can see that on the right. Um, this is a measure for the availability of food in the surrounding as well um, as for changes in pollination activity. To train our neural networks, we have analyzed more than 19 billion images so far, and the German government will soon be supporting our research and development with an additional 1.4 million euros. In the future, we may also be looking for additional funding to scale the application of our product and service. Among the customers um, already using our technology and doing studies with us are producers of plant protection products, as well as regulatory institutions. 
We assist them in conducting the studies they already do by including our monitoring technology and providing them with the previously mentioned data. They have a strong interest in assuring the best product safety standards possible and to be prepared for expected regulatory changes. EFSA is currently working on revising its guidance documents on pesticide risk assessment with stricter regulations on trigger values as well as testing protocols expected by next year. And our customers consider working with our technology their best way to be able to prepare for the upcoming changes. This is what you can imagine the results of an analysis of us to look like. In this case, we assess the effects of a neonicotinoid on activity and foraging behavior over the course of several months. And what we observed um, was a strong negative effect in the short term, but no long term effects for this case. Regarding the market, we feel there is a lot of potential for impact as well as business. Vast amounts of plant protection products are applied every year all around the globe. And with a growing population demanding food, the need for crop protection will most likely continue to increase. By making sure these products are safe, we could prevent negative effects on biodiversity in the future, which we have seen in the past. With the public pressure increasing, the plant protection industry is apparently willing to go the extra mile on testing. That is our impression from the demand we get. Regulatory changes, of course, would further boost the demand of our technology. What unites us at EPIC is the desire to use our skills as well as the latest technology to drive a positive change. And our strengths lie in the field of computer science, hardware design, and communication. With uh, responsibilities in these three fields sort of split between the three founders, Frederic, Matthias, and myself. If you share our mission, please spread the word. We're looking for new customers and fields of uh, application for our technology. And if you'd like to learn more, check out our website or shoot me an email. I would be really delighted to tell you more. Um, thanks for your attention. And on the next slide, you can find our contact information. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you so much. Uh, when we uh, started this accelerator, diversity was a, a big uh, goal of us, but uh, bringing bees to the accelerator is definitely something we, we did not expect, and uh, this is great. All right, so let's see uh, questions we have for you. Um, which are your most valuable partners with regards to market entry? Okay, so I think what's been helping us a lot is that we've been working with the uh, a mark, world market leader in the field of ecotoxicology, that is like the science of how certain products um, impact the environment. And the market leader has been approaching us in the beginning and telling us like, couldn't your technology have a great impact in our industry? And they have been working with, with us ever since. We did our first projects together and we published on scientific conferences the results of them. And they were also like a lot of giving us a lot of context into the uh, into the industry. There's not that many people active in the field. So it's like 300 and people know each other. There's a lot of trust. And by having somebody to speak for you, that's very valuable. And they also brought us our first paying customers with the first uh, study with a real new product. And I think that's been very valuable. Also, we've been working with uh, Bayer, who's a major producer of brand protection products. And I think that's also very helpful. The last one, as we are going on um, regulatory changes, is the Julius Kühn Institute in Germany who is the main regulatory institution when it comes to testing of plant protection products. And they want to check out how our technology can benefit them. And we're also doing studies with them. So I feel that they are like a multiplicator for, um, for what we are doing and for scaling into the market. Great. Uh, talking about regulatory environments, uh, do you see the regulatory environments being uh, more supportive uh, in Germany or in Europe in general? Well, the, the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, has demanded uh, changes in stricter regulations and there's a working group who's actually actively working on this right now. The new guidance document on this will be, um, will be published probably in March 2021. And there will be stricter there will be stricter measures, and they won't be able to be implement uh, to to implement these measures without better testing. And that's why um, our technology will be a key driver in this, or it could be a key driver in this. 
Great to hear. All right, and one last question, uh, which I uh, really like. Uh, what were your key learnings during uh, this accelerator program? Um, I think it was also in the in the beginning. It was very much focused on our team because we've been growing a lot lately. So we we came from like seven people to twelve people, which is like a big difference when it comes to the structures you need as a company. And um, I think we've got pr gotten pretty proud with this, with like just implementing new structures for documentation for how we can meet effectively and still be productive, even though there's more people now. And what else is there? I think the other other thing that helps us a lot was uh, to focus on what we actually want to do and want to achieve. So there are a lot of different areas where the technology could be applied to and different markets. Uh, but we figured out that the ecotoxical market has the biggest level for us to change something and has the biggest impact. And the program helped us a lot to just uh, focus on it and remove other distractions um, and to move forward. Yeah, I think the same applies to our hardware and software strategy because by focusing on a certain area, we will be we definitely more able to plan better for the future with uh, how we will progress with our hardware and software development. I think those were the three main areas. We we got to learn something. Of course, there were a lot more. <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you Thank you so much, Katarina. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, our next uh, startup, Ellipsis, uh, unfortunately could not join us. Uh, so we're going to take a, a five minute break now. And uh, my colleague Jeremy is going to welcome you back. Uh, so please take this moment to stretch, have a drink, uh, watch your favorite YouTube video, and then uh, we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, welcome back to the second half of our program this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, very uh, great work by uh, our group of startups in the first half. Thank you all so much, and thank you for the audience participation and for, for the questions. We really appreciate it. Um, to, uh, to kick off the second half, um, we, we heard from, from one of our executive sponsors, uh, Jason, at the beginning, and now I'm delighted uh, that we get to hear from uh, our second executive sponsor, um, Agni, who is the direct global director for Google for Startups, um, who would like to say a few words of congratulations to the startups. So Agni, take it away and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy, and uh, hello all. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really thrilled. And as Jeremy said, I really wanted to congratulate to all of you. And honestly, I can't believe it's been already five months. I remember the beginning of the program. And at, um, at the moment, I, I feel um, really uh, reflecting uh, on, you know, like what has happened and whether we we were helpful to you. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it, but let me start from saying you are all very special. You are very special because of a few reasons. The first one is that you are really tackling very important challenges, important for all of us as humans, as a global society. Jensen mentioned that as well. You are very special because we realized during the application process how for social startups, it is actually harder than even for the regular startups because with less resources, you're uh, achieving more impact and you're working so hard. And last but not least, you are so special to us because uh, last December, when we were calling for startups for this accelerator, we just realized that we have 1,200 applications from all around the SDGs and you are special because so congratulations. And also thank you for, for your trust, your trust uh, to Google that we can help you develop. Uh, I just wanted to also reflect on what we were doing at, for you and with you during, during this time. So we were trying to, of course, provide different trainings around the SDGs, UX, tech, funding, and other areas. But we also wanted to help you as leaders. Uh, we believe that also at Google, we, we try to do a lot for the people that are within our company, and we always try to share all the best practices. So I hope that all these uh, sessions around uh, effective leadership, building teams, and also, you know, diversity or generally managing were useful to you. I would love to hear your feedback later on. I also wanted to mention uh, connections and partnerships. We know partnerships are extremely important to startups who work in this social uh, social area. And we are trying uh, to connect you to the right organization just because we as a company work with various international organizations like United Nations Women, the Danish Refugee Council, Response Innovation Lab, UNICEF, and many others. And I hope that all the collaborations that we could uh, facilitate during these programs were helpful. Uh, Jason mentioned, I think, about the technical support that our program provides. But I also wanted to say a few words about the other type of support that Google is trying to help with. And uh, I will just mention a few examples also of the startups that have not presented yet. So I will try not to tell too much. One of them is SkillUp. Uh, SkillUp is a personal career assistant, and they entered our accelerator at a pivotal moment in their growth. We were trying to help them in three areas. One was funding, second was product, and third was growth. In terms of funding, together with Google's investment team, uh, SkillUp managed to actually sharpen their pitch and their financial projections and the investor engagement strategy. This resulted in a structured and very professional seed stage fundraising round. Congratulations, by the way, Skill Up team. In terms of product, uh, I hope you remember all these countless mentoring sessions and the uh, collaborative work and uh, how you set up the UX and UI processes and also prepared an engineering roadmap together with uh, all of our mentors that hopefully is like competitive uh, with uh, the other startups in this space. And I'm very happy to say that I saw that all of this has been done in the spirit of user empowerment and ethical use of AI. 
Last but not least, also in terms of skill up, we try to help them with their growth. Like uh, every startup, they of course wanted to uh, hire more people and uh, gain the best talent possible. So I hope that uh, our, our connection to the team uh, that works with development and uh, also remote work helped skill up with the hiring best practices and uh, helped help them to build a diverse and inclusive team. I also hope that it helped you, you know, with things like compensation and uh, also that you benefited from the manager's best practices and even OKR setting. You also uh, and um, you also saw today um, another wonderful start startup that uh, also have a wonderful uh, or nearly a wonderful in their in their name. It's a wonder tree. Uh, and what I liked a lot about this startup personally is that how they pivoted their business model during COVID from the B2B to B2C and uh, how we as a, as a team try to help them just leveraging our search data to find the best uh, priority market that they should target outside of Pakistan. I'm also proud uh, seeing the team not only using the OKR setting, but also how it influenced, uh, you know, the efficiency and motivation of the team. And uh, the last example that I wanted to share is from actually from today, Solar Freeze. This is a startup that is based in Kenya and uh, they are providing uh, on-demand solar powered freezers to farmers. And this, the news from today is that just they got a partnership with SNV, a Netherlands Development Organization, and they provide freezers for the Kakuma. This is a refugee camp of North Kenya, and it has population of 200,000 people. So I know that partnerships are so critical for the social impact startups, and I hope that this partnership will really set you for success in the future. Last but not least, uh, I just wanted to mention that we are learning a lot thanks to this program. Uh, we are learning a lot from you as entrepreneurs and um, also it's very close to our heart what you are doing. And although there are so many of these challenges, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm very proud of the yesterday's announcement uh, of Sundar uh, who talked about how we are committed to a third decade of climate, uh, climate action and a carbon free future. So I hope that uh, Google uh, operating at the carbon free energy like 24 by 7 is setting a good benchmark for all the other tech companies uh, in the world. Thank you so much. Congratulations again and good luck with the rest of the pitches. <laughs> to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agni. We really, we really appreciate it. Um, the uh, we, we could not do this program without executive support from from you and from Jason and, and others. So uh, so thank you so much. I, we really appreciate it. And I know that the startups appreciate it as well. Um, so a, as we know, this this accelerator is based on uh, startups that are doing uh, creating a product or a service that advance one or more of the UN sustainability goals. Um, the the SDGs, and I'm quoting now, are, are a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. It's a huge, uh, huge audacious goal, and uh, uh, but it's not just about climate. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, the SDGs are all about climate, but it, it, it's broader than that, as we've seen from all of our startups. And yet, um, we're thrilled that we have uh, three startups in in the program that are dealing directly with with climate and climate change. Uh, I'm I'm especially excited to hear now from from Aurora Tech, as Jason uh, mentioned in his opening remarks. I was also affected by by the fires in in California, and uh, I'm eager to hear uh, for you all to hear what Aurora Tech has been doing uh, to help with that problem. So the folks from Aurora Tech, Bjorn, please take it away, sir. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And yeah, good morning, good evening, or good night, ladies and gentlemen, depending on from where you're listening. Uh, I'm Bjorn Stoffers, co-founder of Aurora Tech, and we are a startup based in Munich, Germany, using the capabilities of new space to keep the earth we live on sustainable. Um, last winter, Australia was on fire, and not just for a day or for a week, but for months. 
So the devastating results are uh, 186,000 square kilometers of burned area. That is almost half the area of California. Almost 6,000 buildings were destroyed, 34 people were killed directly, and more than 400 by exposure to toxic fumes. Billions of animals died, and the smoke plumes traveled uh, as far as Argentina and Chile. The total CO2 emissions were more than 300 million tons. That's more of uh, what California emitted during this year. So for everyone listening from the United States, this seems shockingly familiar. But what can you actually do to prevent fires from becoming disasters? So would you be able to change the outcome if you knew of every fire as soon as it starts and knew exactly how it spreads? And the answer is yes, yes, you would. So we talked to hundreds of experts around the world. And although the environments are so different, there was a surprising overlap. Besides fast detection and precise information, uh, we need everything in one single system, and it needs to be very accessible. And this is exactly what we do. We cover the whole circle from risk assessment, the fast detection and monitoring of fires, and analyzing the damage afterwards to learn for the future. Um, we created Aurora Tech's wildfire service, short WFS. And we are processing data from 12 different satellites in the thermal infrared and the visible spectrum. Then we cluster the detections to hold fire events and apply an advanced false positive rejection algorithm. You can monitor your area of interest and get instant alerts. And you can use our large data archive for fires, different visualizations, and we integrated wind and weather data for the risk assessment. Our WFS runs seamlessly in all devices, and we cannot just integrate customer data like infrastructure overlays, ground-based camera systems, or weather stations. But if needed, we make all our data available via API to be integrated into any control room. Um, we closed five large important enterprise customers this summer alone, while another 18 are currently in contract negotiations, and several hundred users are testing the system worldwide. Um, some of our customers are the British Columbia Wildfire Service in Canada, um, Forestry Corporation New South Wales, Australia, taking care of the for state forests, and one of the largest paper producers worldwide, Araoku in Chile, managing more than a million hectares of forest with hundreds of camera systems, airplanes, and helicopters. And during the corona lockdown, we helped them to detect fires in the forest that they would otherwise have missed and prevented significant damage to their assets. But the question is, what makes us special? So while our current system does an incredible job, there are still gaps in the coverage of thermal infrared data. So starting next year, in 2021, we are launching our own nanosatellite constellation to significantly increase the frequency of overpasses. And our CubeSats come with three key innovations. We have a patented new framework, which allows for a 40% larger payload volume, a novel thermal infrared imager, and we process the data uh, directly on orbit for instant notifications. Uh, we offer our service as uh, direct online subscriptions for small landowners and an advanced version for professional users with extended features. But mostly, we're focusing on bringing the enterprise package to customers in wildfire services and the commercial forestry, as we have seen, um, insurance companies, electricity supplies, and other corporates who want to monitor their supply chain. And with a monthly subscription fee, which is tailored to the customer's need um, and a very high satisfaction rate, we make sure to keep every customer and upgrade them when new features are available. Um, in total, we have identified more than a 1,000 of those potential enterprise customers in various industries and a global market, market potential of over half a billion. But the good part is our data can be used for many other use cases. We already started to monitor factory output and gas flares. And other applications are evapotranspiration measurement for agriculture, um, urban climate, improving weather models, climate change research, and many, many others. Um, the total market for Earth observation services is growing to about 20 billion euros in the next years, with a market potential for our services of over 3 billion in 2025. And all of this is just possible because of a wonderful team with people from 12 countries and diverse backgrounds, many of whom gathered experience uh, working together in a satellite project at the University in Munich. And we are now closing our Series A round with uh, 5 million euro to expand our sales activities and to look for uh, cooperation partners for our wildfire service. And I want to especially uh, take the opportunity to thank everyone at Google in the Accelerator program who was involved. And um, yeah, it was just great. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for your attention. 
Awesome. Thanks, Bjorn. I really appreciate it. A couple of questions um, coming in from the audience. Um, with the recent wildfires in California, are you getting additional attention? And if so, um, how is that changing or affecting your trajectory? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, absolutely. Um, we are getting lots of uh, requests for the system um, from the United States, especially from California right now, um, and are very happy that we can uh, extend the market um, to the United States as well. Excellent. Thanks so much. I'm just checking for any other questions for you. Okay. Um, do you plan to offer a B2C model for people who live close to wildfires? Jason mentioned his being affected by it and um, uh, would be interesting for, 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 for individual consumers to be able to access your technology. So is that in the plan as well? Yeah, so we have been focusing on the enterprise customers uh, at the moment, uh, but we have to absolutely, uh, especially with the fires around California, see the need uh, to provide the service for um, a B2C as well. And uh, our vision or our dream would be to cooperate with Google and um, implement our data in the Google Maps for early warnings. Okay, excellent. And I think we have time for, for one more. Uh, how do you protect your ground-based sensors to ensure power and connectivity? So a nice technical question there. Yeah, so we don't have any ground-based uh, sensors, um, but we can integrate ground-based sensors that are already uh, set up, um, Yeah, especially in the commercial forestry. We already did that. We have one partner, Firehawk, a company in, in South Africa, and um, we are pretty data agnostic, so we can integrate any uh, camera data that is available. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, um, we will free, really appreciate it, Bjorn. Uh, we're going to move on to our next startup. Um, and let's hear from Ever Impact. And I think we're getting. Hi, I'm Mathieu Carlier, the CEO of Ever Impact, a carbon footprint software for cities and businesses. Actually, let me start with a question. Did you know that actually most cities and businesses under pressure to reduce carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. Currently, uh, cities and businesses are relying on greenhouse gas inventories. These are two years old Excel uh, estimates based on self-reported data from different stakeholders. Uh, and as a result, uh, regulators and investors do not really trust the data sufficiently. That means that cities and businesses are missing out on $100,000 to $5 million per year in uh, funding for their projects. We have the solution. We have developed an IoT software platform to automatically make the carbon footprint of cities and businesses. And we provide them with automated measurements. We identify reductions and help them achieve reductions. We certify the data, so it is trusted by investors and regulators, and we help them generate revenues to uh, finance their green projects. To do this, uh, we use satellite images, uh, satellite data, sensors data, and AI and machine learning, all these combined into our easy to use dashboard. Uh, we have already worked with eight smart cities in Europe, cities like London, Manchester, Porto, Barcelona, Madrid, uh, Santander, Malaga, and Herning in Denmark, at eight cities in Europe. And recently, uh, we have been uh, chosen by the whole shipping industry, uh, 10 key players, who wanted to decarbonize uh, the shipping industry. So they called upon 1,000 startups to uh, decarbonize shipping and we got uh, chosen as the co2 tracking company uh, we are now entering a distribution deal uh, with the largest shipping network uh, to access 26,000 ships and 2200 ports this is a whole new market opening up for us there are currently 10,000 cities and 16,000 companies that have already committed to reduce carbon emissions by 40 percent in the next 10 years. This brings our market 
to 6.7 billion uh, words. Our business model is that we sell monitoring as a service. We sell a monthly subscription that includes IoT software, satellite data, sensors and sensors data, and the monetization of carbon emissions. All these included in the monthly subscription. We differentiate from competitors by bringing unique, uh, unique satellite data, unique sensors and sensors technology and data, unique measuring algorithms to come up to uh, the carbon footprint, CO2 monetization, and a unique access to market. We sell through channel partners to go to market, companies in the transport, telecom, energy, and waste sectors, but also any low carbon uh, solutions or consultants working with cities and businesses. We've done it before. Uh, our team comes from the United Nations system. We have led and scaled three UN agencies in the past. Our chairman, Jan Matson, uh, has actually uh, led UNOPS as the executive director from several hundred million dollars in revenues up to $1.2 billion in revenues in eight years. This meant scaling to 7,000 staff. Our CTO, Alain Retier, was the uh, founder of the two first satellite agencies in the UN, UNOSAT, that was using satellite imagery to uh, support the peacekeepers in their operations, and CLIMSAT, the first uh, satellite agency to monitor climate in the UN. I have myself worked uh, in deploying hardware and software IT systems for over 50 presidential elections in developing countries. We are now bringing uh, this unique expertise uh, and experience to Ever Impact. And uh, we are currently, as part of the Google Accelerator, fundraising. We have already received the first commitments from the EU's largest public and private partnership addressing climate change. And we hope uh, you will join them uh, and invest in us. Why? Because there is a strong pressure to reduce carbon emissions in many industries and in cities. Uh, we have a unique technology that is generating revenues for an easy adoption and is paying back the technology after one year. We have traction in several markets and an experienced team to deliver on the plan. So feel free to reach out to me. My name is Mathieu Carlier, the CEO of Ever Impact. You have my email address here and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Great presentation, Mathieu, and thank you for joining us live for the Q&A. Um, question, uh, are, are you closing a seed round and when is it closing? Yes, correct. Uh, we are closing a, a seed round. Uh, we already got the, the first commitment uh, from this uh, public-private partnership of the European Commission. And so we, we are closing soon in, in a couple of months um, and we are waiting for the last investors to join us. Awesome, thanks. And um, do you have any objectives in, term of, in terms of the impact of your startup? How are you guys thinking about impact? Yeah, uh, we, we actually measure CO2 emissions, right? So uh, we also make it a priority to, uh, to have an impact and, and measure that, uh, and ourselves included. Um, but one of our uh, okay, so we, we work with Google in developing some key targets for ourselves. And one of them was the impact we have. And we set the goals to try to measure half a billion uh, CO2 tons in the next two years and try to help reduce uh, a quarter of a billion tons uh, in the next two years as well uh, through the, the partners we work with. So, um, so we definitely uh, take the CO2 metrics in, uh, as, as one of the key results in, uh, in our company as well. Awesome. Yeah. Quarter of a billion tons. That sounds very, very ambitious for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, one, one last question. Um, and one of our favorites, what were your key learnings during the accelerator program? Um, well, summarizing it to only one is hard, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I would say the, um, the uh, OKR uh, to, so to, to set some targets, uh, objective key results, right, which is the, the Google model, um, has been very good for us because it allowed us to uh, focus 
uh, a lot and everybody pulled in the same direction. And uh, this has been a bit of a revealing moment for us to uh, to really ach achieve those objectives. So, so we actually uh, nailed a lot of these milestones during the accelerator and, uh, and, and uh, it was great to have Google help us focus. Awesome. And uh, Zach Ross, who is our OKR uh, guru, I know you're out there in the audience somewhere, Zach. So thank you for, for helping uh, uh, Matteo and the rest of the startups with that. Um, one last question. Um, how are you prioritizing growth versus profitability? Um, well, it, it is. We, we actually think the, the two uh, going together. Uh, okay. So we, we don't choose growth over profitability because we believe the economy of tomorrow uh, is going to be the one encompassing both the environmental goals and, and the profitability goals. So, uh, so, so that's why we're trying to have a, an approach where we link climate and the environment to also the bottom line of companies and, and try to change the new normal into included environment uh, in, in those uh, factors. So, um, so you see a lot of companies and Google made an announcement yesterday uh, where uh, climate and carbon emission is becoming a key metric. And, and we think that the profit and, uh, and the impact go hand in hand nowadays, and uh, it's going to be the new normal. And, and we've been thinking about this for years, and we, awesome. we were firm believers from the beginning. Awesome. That term new normal is something we're all talking a lot about lately. So. Uh... Uh, uh, best of luck as you as you work to shape that that new normal. We really appreciate your your presentation. Okay, um, next up uh, we have uh, Servest and Iggy from Servest. Take it away, sir. Hey, Jeremy, how are you? Um, my name is my name is Iggy Bassi. Hello, everybody. I'll be joined today by my chief business officer Mark um, Hodgson, and we'll tell you our story at Servest. So before I start, I'd just like to extend our thank you and gratitude to the team at Google for their great um, SDG program. We found it valuable and very, very practical. Most, most accelerated um, programs are not practical. Stepping back, the, the um, story of Sylvester really started 10 years ago when I started and I built a farm in West Africa. It was an agribusiness. And it was my first-hand experience of climate volatility and ex extreme weather events. I knew at the time that we needed new tools. It was very clear to me that the old tools of yesterday were not working to measure climate risk. So I started research into artificial intelligence and climate decisions. And in 2016, I set up a company called um, Sylvest, and it was really to bridge the gap between climate awareness and making better decisions. And our mission was to empower everyone to, to make informed climate decisions through our Earth Science AI platform. I think whether it's a farm in Ghana, whether it's a nuclear plant in Japan or forest in um, California, it's very clear that rising climate volatility is really negatively impacting our physical assets and our natural assets, built and natural environments. And it's really having impacts across economies and um, societies, everything from supply chain disruption, financial losses, insurance, and um, everything through to migration patterns, food security, all the way through, in very extreme places, conflict. And um, I think um, today, more than ever, we're seeing this accelerated urgency across businesses, enterprise, particularly after COVID, to really understand, quantify, and adapt to climate risk. But there's a challenge, and the challenge is most organizations really struggle to quantify the magnitude, the timing, the impact of climate risk, particularly at an asset level, assets that matter to people. Or putting it differently, um, um, companies find it very difficult to personalize climate to, to actually make it truly decision useful. Now, there are three key barriers to this. One, it is scientifically very difficult to quantify climate risk. Secondly, it's very difficult to integrate most of the world's sciences at an asset level. Most of them are not designed for asset level. Um, and the third area, there, there are just no standards. Uh, the world hasn't developed any universal standards to measure and monitor climate risk. So our solution um, is to personalize climate risk with streaming asset level intelligence. So that anybody in the world, um, anywhere, uh, whether any location, any time frame, any scenario, they can understand and measure asset level climate risk. Now, our fundamental proposition is that everybody deserves climate security. We have reached a situation where um, the world is just becoming riskier and riskier every year. 
we have developed an open access platform that aggregates millions of different physical assets and we automate the climate science at a per asset level. So users can really get in, um, personalized intelligence. And there are three ways that this really, really works. A um, user can identify their assets um, on the platform and we have close to a billion assets by quarter one next year. We have about half a billion now. They can track and share that asset in real time intelligence over that asset. And then thirdly, and most importantly, they can integrate that intelligence of what's happening to their asset into their everyday decisions, whether they're operational decisions or their financial decisions um, or their strategic decisions, such as mergers and acquisitions, disclosing um, um, growth, um, locational planning um, in terms of where do we go next. And this is serviced up through an API or through a UI that we built. And our first product, EarthScan, fuses all these capabilities together, and we are currently testing that in the marketplace now with some early adopters. Now, how do we do this? We've spent the better part of the last three years developing something called Earth Science Artificial Intelligence, and it's really a fusion of some very proprietary methodologies where we fuse together very advanced machine learning, uh, which is research-led, uh, mainly around Bayesian frameworks, uh, physical sciences, and also data engineering, so that any user can understand the historic risk over a location of an asset, they can understand their forecasted risk, or they can understand their simulated risk over time. Um, with that in mind, I'm just going to hand over to Mark to finish off the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Iggy. Um, our biggest asset is our team. Sylvest is made up of 37 impatient optimists and leading experts based here in the UK, across Europe and in the US. And what unites us all is this single vision to restore the planet through informed climate decisions. Now, to be a scalable platform that can address this new $16 billion market, we need to have a scalable commercial model. And our enterprise version of our EarthScan product that Iggy just mentioned grants any customer the ability to use all our climate risk assessment capabilities across all of that organization's assets anywhere globally. And in 2021 and 22, we'll add new features that enhance the user's ability to understand and act upon their risk exposure, such as on-demand financial impact on assets and asset risk benchmarking. And vitally, we're starting to partner with business advisory firms and cloud platform providers. Why is that vital? Well, it's to accelerate our enterprise adoption. These are the people that open up board level opportunities, they remove institutional obstacles and provide the necessary expertise to help enterprises make the very best use of our technology. And alongside our enterprise offering, obviously we have another offering underneath. And this is being launched towards the end of Q4 and will be free to use for anyone who uses our platform. This is a world first, we're giving effectively anyone globally insights into their relationship between climate hazards and the assets that they are interested in, they own, they possess, or are influenced by, all served up via a simple and engaging UI. So since joining Google's SDG program uh, earlier this year, we've raised over $6 million. We've landed our first global enterprise customer with a market cap of $10 billion, I believe, and we've built an international and seasoned team. We've just closed over 85% of our current open round. We aim to close the remaining 15% or so in the next three weeks. And now we're kicking off Series A in Q4. So to everyone at the Google Accelerator team and our fellow cohort members, I can't thank you enough on behalf of Sylvester for your support. It's been invaluable. <clears throat> so in closing, imagine what our planet would be if all decisions we make are optimized for climate. Well, Sylvester can enable billions of decisions to be made every day that are informed by climate. Thank you all for being part of our incredible journey to deliver climate security for all. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, thanks so much, Iggy, Iggy and, and Mark. Mark. Uh, uh, time for one time for one audience. 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 How does your technology <laughs> fulfill your vision to restore the planet? That's a great question. I think, uh, first of all, our first set of capabilities is largely around baselining risks. So we need to analyze assets first before we can start thinking about recommendations. So underlying our um, ML platform, we're actually building a system that can start 
thinking about an adaptation um, recommendation engine as well. Because we learn across millions and millions and millions of assets, we think we can put that into production in the next couple of years. And that's gonna be fundamental because I think most of the world's companies and enterprises who own assets, they want asset level advice. What should I do with this asset relative to my forecasted risk and relative to my historic risk? Excellent. And one last quick question. How far back is, the, is your historical data retained? Um, we go back about 50 years, uh, particularly for the weather data. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good time signal, but we go back 50 years across millions of assets. So we can look for different patterns across different um, space and time. And that's a really important uh, feature towards our prediction. So usually 50 years, and we're looking right now at eight different dimensions of climate, and we're taking that up to about 16 different dimensions of climate by quarter one next year. Awesome. Thanks so much. Great presentation, and we really appreciate all the hard work that you all are doing. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, we're on to our last section of, of startups, uh, and these three startups are dealing with, with economic opportunity as part of the SDGs. Uh, so we would like to bring um, uh, Simon from OCO uh, to the stage. Uh, Simon, take it, take it away and please tell us all about OCO. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you all for joining in. What if I told you that if it doesn't rain by the end of this week, you will lose all your income for the next six months? You would feel helpless, right? How is that fair? How is that a thing? Well, that is the situation for the everyday situation for 500 million families around the world who live from unirrigated farming. And this is exactly what happened to Sané, a farmer I met in Mali. Due to insufficient rain, Sané lost all his harvest for the year, all his income. He had to sell his, his remaining, remaining assets and start back from scratch. Oko has an insurance solution for all these unbanked smallholder farmers. We are talking here about 500 million small and medium businesses who can all spend a few tens of dollars every year in insurance. This translates into a $20 billion opportunity just waiting to be taken. This opportunity exists because traditional crop insurance was never designed for smallholder farmers. Sending an agent on site to verify the extent of the damages it's not scalable. On top of that, how do you bring insurance to someone like my friend Sané, who lives far from any city, has no bank account, and never received financial education? On the contrary, OCO offers an insurance that is fully automated, paperless, affordable, and accessible even if you don't have a bank account. All you need is to dial a short code to access our menu. In a few clicks, you can find your insurance details and pay your policy. And this works from any phone, even without internet connectivity. So how do we do that? It's very simple. First, farmers dial a short code to connect to OCO and receive a personalized quote based on their location, their crop, and their field size. Next, farmers pay a small premium via their phone to be covered. And finally, OCO uses weather information, artificial intelligence, and satellite data to monitor the fields. And if we identify that the field has been affected by adverse weather, we automatically pay out a compensation. We are positioned as an insurance broker, and we take a commission from the revenue we generate for the partnering insurance company. Insurers pay us to design the product, distribute it, and manage the claims. To scale, we can team up with local insurers and mobile operators all around the world. We already signed partnerships with Orange and Allianz in Africa. And more recently, we signed with a major agro-industry player, AB InBev. Our current partners already allow us to scale to most countries in Africa. We started in Mali, and we achieved there something quite remarkable. We hired and trained agents to interact with farmers. And in only three months, we received 30,000 calls. We registered 5,000 farmers, and more than 1,800 of them are now insured with OCO. They paid via mobile and got insured for the first time in their life. You can see here some of the farmers who already received the compensation and expressed their gratitude. Unlike Sané, 
they have been able to maintain their income level and prepare the next seasons without sacrificing any of their assets. Even better, we negotiated preferential access to microloans for our farmers. So they have been able to finance an expansion of their activities. Other companies on this segment have proven that this is a service that can work, but they all failed to scale fast enough because farmers need to be in the right cooperative or work with the right microfinance organization to access the products. With OCO, all you need is a phone, which makes us the most universally accessible solution and allows us to scale bigger and faster. We have a great international team that combines relevant expertise and a shared passion for development. Shazad has been working for five years now in Africa, developing innovative mobile solutions for smallholder farmers. Mariam was recognized by the Mandela Washington Fellowship as a key young African leader. Rafael brings five years of actuarial experience, and I, Simon, worked in the microinsurance industry for the past six years. And I successfully brought affordable insurance to almost half a million people in places like Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and Egypt, where insurance was not accessible before. To sum up, OCO unlocks a huge opportunity for insurance companies, serves a need felt by billions of people around the world, and provides mobile operators with a relevant service that takes full advantage of their mobile money services. We invite you to join us in this adventure because we know that with the right partners, we can create the most impactful insurance product ever created. Thank you. All right, thank you, Simon. A great presentation um, and great work with, with the farmers that you're working with. A uh, couple of questions from the audience. Um, I've seen this technology in East Africa where devices are used to determine farmer risks and they've been in place for at least 10 years. How are you different from them? Great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking. What we've seen is that the technology, these products indeed have been around for about 10 years. The problem is that they never scale fast enough. And why? Because they're not accessible uh, to, to access these products. You need to educate the farmers. You need to, um, to usually make them sign a document. You need to partner with, uh, with uh, cooperatives or microfinance organizations. And it takes a, huge, a, lot of, a lot of time to connect with all these different partners. So what we bring is this mobile connectivity, which means that anyone with a phone, regardless whether they have internet or not, regardless whether they have smartphone or not, can access this uh, insurance product. They don't need to be in, in a cooperative that already agreed to it. They don't need to have taken a loan everyone has, can access it. So we bring really scalability uh, and distribution to a solution that has been promising for many years now, but never managed to scale fast enough. Okay, great. Uh, another question from, from Robert. How do you profile your customer's credit risk so that you can underwrite an interest rates for insurance? All right, so uh, we look at 25 years of historical weather data uh, at their location, at the precise village or commune. And we look at the frequency and intensity of weather events in the past, such as droughts and floods. So we can very precisely determine what is the risk that we are taking for to insure these customers and therefore price the insurance product. Uh, this is done in collaboration with Allianz. So we are sure that these products are fully uh, tested and that they are uh, yeah, priced accordingly for the risk that we are underwriting. Then uh, when we talk about credit risk uh, and interest rates, well, I think you're also referring to uh, microloans. So we don't provide microloans ourselves, but we bring the more certainty to the microloan partners that the loans will be reimbursed because if the farmers is not available to produce enough to, uh, to generate revenues and reimburse a loan, the insurance will kick in and uh, bring um, the reimbursement for the, for the credit product. Excellent, thanks. Great presentation and, and great questions from the audience. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Simon. And um, you definitely win the, the award for one of the most engaged founders in the program. So we really appreciate it. All right. Um, next up, we're going to hear from, from Solar Freeze. Um, uh, I think we're gonna play their video, so take it away. Hi everyone, morning, afternoon, evening, and good night, depending on where you are in the world. It is indeed a pleasure to meet you. My name is Edwin from Solar Freeze. 
and who is Solafis that I'll let you know shortly. To start us off, I'd like to start with a story that epitomizes our call to action, a story of three women, Esther, Luther, and Martha, three smallholder farmers who make a living farming kills, capsicum, and tomatoes on a one acre piece of land in Eastern Kenya. They derive so much joy from what they do, as you can see in the, from their bright smiles in the background. However, their joy is short-lived and hard work doesn't pay much because come harvest time, they lose half of their harvest every season to post harvest losses. This story is common to most smallholder farmers in Africa. While agricultural production has been rising, thanks to the advent of modern and productive ways of farming, the farmer is getting poorer, losing a good portion of their produce to poor storage methods. Post harvest losses are said to deny smallholder farmers 45% of their hard earned proceeds. This translates to 310 billion US dollars, enough to fund Africa's healthcare budget six times over. As you can see in the picture, these poor storage methods, which are common in rural farms, are largely responsible for this. These methods subject the produce to vermin and decay, reducing the quality of produce and eventual loss after some time. And that's where we come in. At Solafis, we realize that there is a need for proper produce storage to protect the hard work of farmers like Esther and Duze and Martha. We offer farmers cold storage as a service for their perishable farm produce. We do this by offering using solar powered cold rooms installed in farming towns in these rural areas. By paying a small fee, farmers are able to store their produce in optimum temperature and humidity conditions, free from vermin and harmful pathogens, improving the quality and longevity of this farm produce. Today, Martha makes $2,700 a year, six times more from a one acre piece of land by storing her produce with solar fuel. She is able to get better prices for quality produce and is able to wither the glass and sell off season when the supply is low and the demand is high. How does it work exactly? We have strategically placed these cold rooms in farming towns and market centers. A farmer searches for solar freeze cold room closest to their location. We've made it easier through an app. Once identified, they take the produce to the storage facility. The produce is then weighed and the cost calculated. A farmer can choose to pay then or upon retrieval from the cold store. Payments are made through cash or mobile, common with farmers from these areas. The price ranges from 10 Kenya shillings, which is about 10 cents to the dollar, for a crate of produce. For farmers looking to own or acquire their own cold rooms, we provide small freezers that they can purchase on a pay as you go model. Unlike cold rooms, these are fully owned by the farmer who pays a small monthly fee using mobile money until they own, eventually own the unit fully. Once farmers default on payment, the unit is switched off and farmers are unable to use it. Globally, there are 500 million of them, smallholder farmers, supplying 80% of the world's food, hence crucial for global food security. Closer home, Kenya has 4 million of them, with 25% farming perishable produce like kills, spinach, tomatoes, all staple food in most homes. They also happen to be your target market. Farmers have access to government silos, which are biased towards dried foods like maize, but not conducive for perishables. Privately run warehouses, which are quite expensive and out of reach for small farmers, and traditional methods that offer no protection from bombing or harmful pathogens. And that's why ours is quite unique. You see, we offer farmers flexible payment methods, making it affordable for them to store the produce in our cold stores. Our units are largely accessible, as we set them in rural market centers where farmers often come to sell their produce. And leveraging on data, we've been able to drive down our energy expenditure while offering this quality of service to the point that for some of the units, we do not even require batteries. Today, we have 15 community cold rooms installed in various towns. Additionally, we have 60 small units that have been acquired by farmers and altogether, we have impacted the lives of 1,500 smallholder farmers. Over the next year, we intend to make a difference in the lives of 10,000 farmers by having 80 community work increases, 500 small units acquired by farmers. Additionally, we are looking to train and employ 100 young women to maintain them and create 50 new businesses through our franchising model. 
We can't do this alone. To achieve this, we have partnered and are continuing to partner with financial institutions to improve financial accessibility for these products. NGOs to get us to marginalized communities and governments to offer advice and lobby farmers to embrace these solutions. With the community cold rooms, the average income per day is $60 and the cost is recouped over 14 months. One of these cold rooms can store up to 200 crates of produce per day. For the smaller units, the payback period is 18 months with the average monthly payment of $40, translating to about $1.20 a day. To change the fortunes of 10,000, we are looking to raise $2.4 million that will go into purchasing this equipment, installing and supporting these units, hiring new talent and continuous product development. We are on the brink of an exciting journey and there is a huge opportunity ahead for us and we will be excited to have you share it with us. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Really inspiring. Um, amazing to see how how you do the the work of not just helping farmers grow, but also helping helping them them, them preserve their food. Um, a question for you from the audience: Why would a farmer prefer an individual freezer over a shared freezer? All right. Um, I'll It seems like we're having a little bit of connectivity issues. Headwind or dismiss, can you guys hear us? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah. If, yeah. Why I would, would a farmer prefer farmer. an individual freezer over a shared freezer? Yeah, so the farmers in uh, Africa work in cooperatives. So what a cooperative means is an association of uh, 600 uh, farmers uh, planting the same crop at the same season. So it makes economic sense for them to bundle together as an association to work with a larger freezer and use it as a service. So that would be referred by large institutions and cooperatives such as dairy farmers and uh, vegetables and food farmers. And farmers would prefer the smaller units for their own individual use, maybe have uh, had an increase in income and want to uh, have a productive use asset within their homestead or uh, use it for their home uh, for their home or small business use. Awesome, thanks. Um, there's some more questions in the chat on the YouTube live stream. So if you guys want to uh, take take a look at those and you can answer those um, uh, using the chat feature on the YouTube live stream. Thank you all so much uh, for your for your presentation. Um, really inspiring work. All right. Um, last but certainly not least in our 11 startups um, is is Skill Lab. This is a team that's a uh, near and dear to our hearts. This is the second time, second accelerator that we've had the privilege of working with them. Um, and they're going to tell you how they have a platform to increase economic opportunity. Uh, so the Skill Lab team, take it away. Hi, I'm Ulrich Schaaf. And today I have the pleasure to present to you Skill Lab, our Amsterdam-based social business, and with it, our approach to skill-based career support. But before I talk about the product and all of its nuances, I would love to quickly address the problem we're looking at. And that is thinking in degrees and job titles marginalizes many job seekers. And I'm sure you thought about this in its consequences or in some of the signs of it, because the scale of the problem is really massive. Just in our obtainable markets, 41 million job seekers are really stranded on labor markets. And these are pre-COVID numbers. So looking forward into the future, we only know that the scale of individuals that are stuck and are looking for work will only increase. But I don't want to only talk about the scale of the problem. I want to explain why this doesn't work for some individuals. Think of refugees. You move from a country of origin to a new host country. You try to find work, apply, work with career counselors. But all of your past job titles and degrees are pretty meaningless to new employers simply because I can't deal with them or deal with the language 
As a result, you're often seen as low skilled. Think of displaced workers. You invested 30 years into a career or profession, worked in a factory, and due to automation, digitization, and other trends, you're now stuck with an obsolete job and you will have a hard time finding exactly the same job again. You need a new pathway forward that allows you to build on your skill set. And think of informal workers, namely, for example, your mother. Most likely, she had to give up or make sacrifices in her professional career in order to raise you and your family. On paper, she didn't do anything in a job-related manner, but obviously, she picked up many very valuable skills. And what all of these groups and many others have in common is that traditional labor market thinking of degrees, titles, and anything you put on a resume simply doesn't work for them or creates a clear pathway forward. And that's where our approach comes in. So we think in skills and not in titles. And what you see here is our TensorFlow model of our AI, which we train to understand the labor market and people and education on the level of skills and not on the level of titles. And this is the technology that won the Google AI Impact Challenge 2019 and also forms the basis and foundation for our product. And that is a digital career assistant that allows job seekers and any individual to find a pathway forward. The way this works is that you first go through a very detailed interview in up to 27 different languages with our AI, where we capture amongst 13,500 different unique skills, what you exactly did in your life. And then we can match that skill set to every single occupational career that's out there. As a result, on one glance, you get an understanding of what's possible and what you could do with your skill set. If you're interested in a specific occupational career, you can dive deep in, generate application materials, or look at your personal skill gap and find recommended online as well as local education that helps you to upskill yourself and make yourself more employable for the jobs you're really interested in. And while I just explained to your B2C value proposition, our market is actually a little bit more complex. We sell to employment services and training providers. So these can be governments or private organizations. And we sell to them large bundles of skill assessment licenses to our tool, which they then can distribute to job seekers. In return, they get a very, very detailed understanding of the skill profile of any job seeker they serve and can help them to be quicker and better in placing them into jobs and education. That saves them a lot of money. Job seekers, for free, receive through our digital tool career advice and support in being empowered and looking for jobs for themselves. And training providers uh, can easily market courses to the skill gap of job seekers. All of this and this environment allowed SkillLab to bootstrap in the last two and a half years and build a substantive business. And we're now at that point where we'll ask for a 2 million euro investment. That money will mostly go into the product. So, so far, we built for an alpha and beta stage a great starting product, but we want to expand on that. We also built a client base and a great team. But now we want to move forward and by the end of 2022, reach 1.3 million job seekers. That will be roughly also the point where we're either profitable or more likely look for a substantive Series A investment round. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Skill Lab. And again, it was an absolute pleasure to work with you a second time around. Um, a question from the audience. And hi, Kareem, thanks for, for joining us. Um, what is your, sorry, how is your AI learning and developing over time? Thank you very much, Jeremy, for that question. So uh, as a foundation, our AI builds upon nationally, regionally, and internationally recognized skills taxonomies and uses those as a basis for performing a personalized interview and generating a detailed skill profile for a person. As we grow and reach more and more users, uh, we're able to collect more and more information and data on what skills they bring to the table based on their past experiences. And each data point that we collect in terms of what skills a person has received at various experiences, the smarter our AI becomes and the more uh, highly trained it becomes in terms of understanding how different skills relate to each other. And effectively what that means for a person at the end of the day is as we increasingly rely on user-generated data, 
our model really reflects the on the ground realities of what skills people actually have and becomes more effective and more efficient at targeting which skills to ask them about. So that makes the process of interviewing someone and zeroing in on their unique uh, and very personal skill set that much faster, that much easier, and ultimately leads to a skill profile that's generated that increasingly reflects the user and has the user feeling that their entire world experience is reflected in the profiles that we build for them. Awesome. Thanks. And one last question. What is your market traction so far? And can you talk a little bit about your revenue? Sure. So in terms of market traction before revenue, um, currently at this stage in 2020, uh, where uh, we have 13 active clients across four different continents and 12 different countries, um, when we compare that to where we were a year ago, where we were on one continent serving four countries, uh, we're seeing traction in terms of numbers of clients and users. Our subscription levels in terms of the subscriptions to the application that we've distributed have gone up from a few hundred at this point last year to several thousand, around 5,000 this year. And we have several deals uh, currently in the pipeline that would enable us to reach in the coming months, hopefully several tens of thousands users globally. Our monthly active users have also gone up in the last year from uh, a few dozen a day up to several hundred a day now. And in terms of revenue and how that's reflected in revenue, uh, this year alone, we've been able to generate 220,000 euros in revenue in contract-based revenue. That's entirely excluding grant uh, money with grant direct grant uh, financing. We've also been able to reach uh, a total amount of income of about 100, uh, sorry, 1.5 million dollars uh, over the last year and a half. Um, and this, um, uh, by for point of reference, uh, 160 out of the 220,000 euros in revenue are all from 2020. Um, in addition to that, uh, speaking again about the pipeline, the sales pipeline that we currently have, um, we're looking at the potential of raising in contract value alone $100 million uh, in the coming months, uh, excluding grant applications for which we have in the pipeline $2 million uh, currently. Awesome. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the presentation. And again, it was great working with you all a second time around. Thank you. All right. Well, folks, we have reached the end. Um, uh, thank you to the 400 plus Googlers, partners, investors, NGOs, and others who have joined us today. You can see uh, at the bottom of the screen there, we'd love to hear how we did both us as a team and of course the startups. So there's a, a link for a very short feedback survey. Uh, we'd like to say here at Google that feedback is a gift. So uh, please tell us how we did. And a very quick thank you uh, to Andy Watts, our man behind the scenes, who's made all the technical magic happen. Uh, I just want to say, say briefly, um, you know, when we were planning this program, we were all set to gather all the startups and mentors and facilitators in, in Berlin to gather together for, for a big kickoff for this accelerator. And then as we all know, the world changed forever very quickly and we had to make a quick decision on if we would continue the program. So we decided to pivot to this virtual uh, uh, program, uh, something that we quite frankly have never done before. And so we somewhat apologetically uh, told the startups our plan, feeling, that, uh, feeling pretty bad that we cannot uh, deliver on our promise for an in-person accelerator. But when we told the startups this, we got some really interesting and were really pleasantly surprised by, by, by the feedback. They said, hey, you know, thank you for not canceling the program and thank you for not abandoning us. So uh, what I want to do is sort of turn that thanks around to all of the startups uh, Wondertree, MDoc, Flare, Apic, Ellipsis, Aurora Tech, Ever Impact, Service, Oco, Solar Freeze, and Skill Lab, thank you for not abandoning us. And by us, I really mean everyone, by the whole world. Um, thanks for not abandoning hope. Thanks for not abandoning bravery. Thank you for being uh, impatient optimists. As I said, the SDGs are incredibly audacious to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by, by 2030. Thank you so much for stepping up to that challenge, for, for, for being brave, for being optimistic. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with all of you over the course of the past five months, and we cannot wait to see where you go from here. 
All right. Thank you to the startups. Thank you to the team. Thank you to the audience. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. And please go out there, take care of each other and find your own little way as these startups have done and maybe a big way to, to make the world a little bit better place. Thanks. <laughs>